Okay, so good morning everybody and welcome to our panel debate dedicated to the challenges of migration and how to rethink the future of the EU migration policy. Uh, my name is Loredana Teodorescu, I'm in charge of the EU Affairs at Istituto Luigi Sturzo, uh, which is an Italian member foundation of the Martin Center, and I will be moderating this, uh, this panel. Uh, so first of all, let me just say uh, a few words about this topic and about why uh, we chose to talk about migration uh, today. Uh, so we know that despite a general decrease uh, in the number of irregular migrants entering the European Union, uh, migration is still, uh, uh, is still a press pressing issue for the European Union and is becoming more and more uh, uh, divisive and uh, highly politicized. Uh, so tensions uh, between uh, member states even increased in the last month over the all uh, issue of disembarkations, uh, and this is somehow undermining uh, a common response at the European level. Uh, however, we know that uh, this response is very much needed uh, because uh, the European Union has to uh, to cope with future challenges. Uh, we know that all the factors causing uh, migratory flows are still there, uh, like uh, demographic challenges, um, climate change, instability, conflict. So we know that migration will be with us uh, uh, as a challenge for, uh, for the next decades. Uh, we think that uh, it's a good time to discuss about this topic now, as the mandate of the new Commission uh, is approaching. Uh, so we would like to, um, to discuss about what has been done in the last years, uh, but especially about what are still the challenges uh, to overcome, uh, possibly the lessons to be learned and how to move, uh, how to move forward. Uh, in this regard, Ursula von der Leyen already promised a fresh start on migration. Uh, she called for a new narrative on migration, uh, for procedures which uh, can be at the same time effective and human. Uh, so the question now is, uh, uh, do we really need a new pact for migration? Uh, and if so, what uh, do we really need uh, to change? Uh, so what should be the priorities uh, concerning migration for the next uh, years to come? Uh, and how to overcome the divisions also between the member states, because we know that this is uh, really, let's say, undermining uh, a common response from the, from the European Union. Um, so we will address some of these issues uh, with our panelists uh, of today. Uh, let me say just a few words also concerning the format of our panel. Uh, as you may notice, uh, we had to change a little bit the, the panel. Uh, this is because, uh, as I said, this is a, a crucial time to discuss about such a topic. Uh, but this means also that, of course, there are many uh, institutional meetings and events uh, running at the same time. Uh, so Ambassador Massari had to excuse himself. Uh, he's, uh, he's involved in a, in a high-level meeting at the moment. Uh, and so um, uh, Christian Kramer and Han Behrens. Uh, on the other side, we are very lucky because some other uh, distinguished guests um, were able to confirm their presence uh, just yesterday, uh, because they managed to change somehow their agendas. Uh, so we really thank them for, for being here. Um, and now I'd like to, to start uh, and, deepen, and deepen the debate. Uh, I will start with Andrea Biagini, uh, who is the uh, Home Affairs uh, and Justice Coordinator at the Italian uh, Permanent Representative uh, Representation to the EU. Uh, on my left, and then on my right, uh, uh, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Michael Schotter, uh, who is the Director for Migration, Protection and uh, Visa at the European Commission. And then uh, next to him, we have uh, Gertrui uh, Lanneau uh, from uh, IOM. Uh, Gertrui is a Senior Regional Labour Mobility and Human Development Specialist. So I think that we can really have a, a broad uh, picture uh, of what is going on with these uh, three uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, and first of all, let me uh, turn to Andrea Biagini, um, as uh, uh, he's representing Italy, and as we know, uh, Italy as a frontline member state has uh, been under pressure uh, for, the, for, uh, the last, uh, for the last years. So uh, I will ask uh, uh, Andrea uh, to take the floor and make some uh, introductory remarks, some kickoff remarks. Thank you very much, Andrea, for being here. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, Loredana, for the, the invitation, and thank you all for attending today's uh, today's seminar. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to apologize on behalf of Ambassador uh, Massari, who did his utmost uh, to be present uh, here today. First of all, because of the topic. Secondly, because of the network of the institutions uh, that invited him, and uh, namely also Instituto Luigi Luigi Sturzo. Unfortunately, the day before the European uh, Council, things are bound to happen, and at the last moment he was unable to, to be here today and uh, has asked me to represent him, which I do with, uh, with pleasure. So we'll be giving some introductory remarks, first of all, and then participate in the, in the interactive dialogue uh, with, uh, uh, with you. First of all, as Loredana uh, said, the event is uh, indeed extremely timely as we are here today uh, at the opening of a new institutional uh, cycle with the uh, new commission uh, uh, soon to take uh, uh, functions. The European Parliament is up and running and solid committees are, are working. So yes, it is a timely moment to have this kind of, uh, of discussions. Um, secondly, I will give the short answer to the question which is posed uh, in the topic of the panel. Uh, is it the time for the new, new European Pact on Migration? The short answer is yes. It is high time that the European Union agrees collectively uh, on this new common policy on uh, migration, and I would add on uh, asylum uh, as well. Uh, the real question is, uh, is how and uh, I guess that's what we will be debating in the, in the interactive part of our, uh, of, our dialogue, of our dialogue. The question is how, because this, this file, as Loredana said, has proven to be extremely divisive and politicized in each and every member uh, states, and that's why we are basically at the impasse which we are, uh, which we are facing uh, uh, today. Uh, there are several reasons why we are here today, uh, perhaps prioritizing one dimension uh, uh, of the file, right? namely the internal dimension and uh, the reform of the common European asylum system um, has caused that we have progressively lost focus on the bigger picture, alienated trust among ourselves and complicated uh, the path towards uh, uh, a, common, a common agreement. However, if you just read the, the post, the Eurobarometer post, um, they keep on showing that uh, migration together with uh, security is one of the most pressing issues which is felt by ordinary citizens. So as the new commission uh, uh, pledged, it is really time to have a fresh uh, new start on migration to meet the citizens' demands and concerns. Now the height of the crisis in 2015 and 2016, uh, since then much has been done and uh, truth be told, progress has been, uh, has been uh, made in assisting uh, member states. Uh, much more needs, uh, uh, needs to, be done, to be done. Today's numbers are definitely lower than the ones that, um, that we experienced during the, during the crisis. In the central Mediterranean route, for instance, which is the route which concerns us uh, the most, uh, at the end of September we had slightly more than 7,500 arrivals which is almost 65% lower than, uh, than the year before. We must take stock of the lower numbers, but at the same time we should be careful that our judgment is not misguided by them when we devise our common policies. And this, in our view, for at least three reasons. First of all, because numbers may be down along certain routes, but are definitely not down on other routes, such as the Eastern Mediterranean route. And what happens in the Eastern Mediterranean route uh, is a European issue as well. It can definitely have impacts also in Italy through the Western Balkan uh, route. Second, as Loredana was saying, uh, many of the underlying co conditions which led to that crisis are still there. I won't go into details, but Syria, Libya, we all know uh, the situation in these, uh, in these countries. The work on root causes uh, uh, takes time to address uh, the main drivers of migration. The third reason, in our view, is that uh, if we focus only on numbers today, we may be tempted to advance solutions with, which address mainly the so-called secondary movements within EU countries rather than uh, uh, primary ones. And this temptation could be operationally unsustainable, politically divisive, and unable to restore mutual trust, uh, which, in our view, should be at the core of the new institutional cycle. 
rebuilding trust among uh, member states on this very important and sensitive uh, uh, issue. For this reason, I think it's uh, important that we stress the need to pursue a multi-level holistic approach which addresses the migratory file in all its components on and in all its dimensions with the final aim of reaching a operational and political balance between solidarity and uh, responsibility. In our view, we can try to strike this balance by addressing the different dimensions of the challenge protection of external borders and stepping up the fight against the human traffickers, reform of the common European asylum system by taking into account how to strike the balance uh, for the frontline member states and also better addressing secondary movements, reinforcing cooperation with third countries to build their capacities to control routes and borders, improving our overall performance in terms of returns and readmissions, while at the same time providing legal and safe pathways towards Europe for those who are generally fleeing conflict along the model of the humanitarian corridors, safeguarding the free movement within, uh, within uh, Schengen. Now, these are the introductory remarks which the ambassador would have uh, liked to give you just to kickstart this meeting. Just to allow us to conclude with uh, two brief reference to two other teams uh, which are also mentioned in the, uh, in the paper you have received. The first one is on the La Valletta Declaration, which was signed at the end of September between Italy, France, Germany, and, uh, and, and Malta on disembarkation following search and rescue uh, uh, operations. Uh, it's an important step uh, in our view. We have constantly argued that saving lives at sea is an international obligation and uh, we have abided by this legal and moral uh, obligation. However, we, we feel it is important that those disembarked following SAR operations uh, be treated as a special category even outside uh, Dubl Dublin, and that the member states, the frontline member states, uh, do not shoulder all the responsibility following search and rescue operations. So yes, La Valletta del Creation is a first step important first step, only a first step to be put in the wider framework which, was, uh, which I was trying to explain earlier. Second brief reference is on the ongoing MFF uh, negotiations because any policy idea on migration should be backed up by the necessary financial resources to sustain it and implement it. Uh, that's why as Italy we are advocating that a significant amount of uh, uh, the funds uh, in the next MFF be devoted to addressing the holistic approach towards uh, migration. So yes, it is timely. Yes, we look very much forward to the new pact on migration and asylum, which uh, the Commission uh, will could uh, put forward. In our reading, uh, just of the labeling, uh, um, is that uh, perhaps uh, um, the Commission will try to broker a deal on the whole spectrum of the migration file and not on its single pieces or parts of it, could pursue this uh, multi-level holistic strategy and approach towards migration, which we, at least as Italy, have uh, promoted uh, since the beginning of the crisis and in earlier years as well. Thank you, and once again, really apologies on behalf of Ambassador Massari. Okay, Andrea, thank you very much. I think that you highlighted already a lot the complexity of the issue and all the elements uh, which are uh, which are there uh, if we talk about uh, the migration challenge uh, i will come back to you also concerning maybe uh, the malta declaration which is the more recently uh, step towards this uh, uh, common management of uh, migratory flows. Uh, but now I will turn uh, uh, to Michael, uh, who is today, let's say, the, the voice of the Commission. <laughs> um, so I would like to ask you uh, if you can highlight a little bit uh, what are the main achievements in the last uh, month, uh, but uh, um, also what are the challenges that we still need to overcome and what should be, in your view, the priorities for, uh, for the next uh, months to come for the European Union? Well, thank you very much, uh, Loredana, and um, also 
Uh, can I say it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a bit last minute, but uh, but uh, it's uh, I think it's important to to be here to to have this opportunity to discuss with with you to hear uh, Andrea, which and it, as an introduction is. Very hard to disagree with, uh, with with the points made there, and, and you'll hear many things I say that will echo, I think, uh, what you just heard. Um, of course, I'm here uh, from the Commission, but it's a it's an interesting time for the Commission because it's uh, in the on a point of transition. So um, it's difficult for me to sort of give you a sort of clear line on the way ahead because politically on these very sensitive subjects. Uh, of course, it's not for me as a, as a humble director to, to, to set out the way ahead. Uh, it's for the new college to, to establish its way. The president-elect uh, has uh, set out her, in her political guidelines some very wise uh, considerations, I think, uh, uh, in terms of echoing this comprehensive approach. But now, of course, the real uh, work begins. But let, before I get to, to the forward-looking, let me just uh, follow uh, briefly the, the, the schema that you, you set out at the beginning. So let's look at what has been achieved. And I think a lot has been achieved over, over this last uh, period. Uh, if you can cast your mind back to 2015-16, it really was a, a very difficult situation. I mean, the numbers involved uh, were, were very high. I, mean, I think we had two million people arriving uh, at our shores over a space of two years. Um, very high level of arrivals. I think uh, in one month, uh, uh, in, in at the height of the crisis in 2015, we had upwards 230,000 people arriving uh, in one month. I, this is, a, is an enormous uh, challenge. And of course, now we've arrived at a stage where those numbers have come right down. Um, we've also seen the fluidity of the, of the movements. We started off in 2015, we had the Eastern Mediterranean route uh, being uh, the, the source of, of these high numbers. Um, then we had uh, developments like the EU-Turkey statement, which really changed enormously the, uh, the, the, the way, uh, we, and we made much progress through that. Um, but then we saw that the central Mediterranean route, uh, Andrea mentioned these pressures. And then more recently, we saw it also on the western Mediterranean route, where, and as we kind of focus and, and take uh, more control, and we have been successful, I think, in, in, in responding to this in various ways, and you have to have tailor made, I think, solutions, which, which uh, because there's no sort of one size fits all single solution. You have to adapt, you have to work in a comprehensive way, you have to work with partner countries uh, in Africa, as we saw also we, we're working with Turkey. Um, and in this way, we've managed to, to have success, and I think we should say that. But it, as we've also said, this is no um, means a, a reason for complacency. The situation has taught us that uh, events arise, the situation is volatile. Um, so we have to be responsive and we have to have in place, I think, um, stable systems for the future. But looking, um, I mentioned the EU-Turkey, we've also, um, over the course of over the last five years, saved an enormous number of lives. I mean, 760,000 uh, people were rescued at sea. Andrea mentioned this, uh, this aspect. Um, we've also um, uh, given a lot of support to uh, frontline uh, countries uh, in, in terms of uh, setting up the, the hotspots. Um, I'm not saying that uh, the situation is easy in these hotspots. We, again, it's not a situation of complacency. We have to keep on focusing uh, on, these, on these issues. But we've given a lot of uh, funding support. Um, over 10 billion euros has been uh, available since the start of the crisis. We also had, um, admittedly, a controversial, but I think ultimately within the um, remit uh, that was there, successful uh, relocation arrangements from Italy and Greece, um, which was a very tangible form of solidarity. Um, we've set up a, uh, we've had two uh, modifications of the European border and Coast Guard. We set it up, uh, it evolved out of, of what was Frontex. 
And uh, just uh, at the begin uh, earlier in this year, we had a second modification where we set out uh, the, uh, uh, the requirement now to set up a standing core. So this shows also the attention being focused on, on in different dimensions, on this case in, in reinforcing our, our ability to, to provide European solidarity at the external border, because the European border and Coast Guard is made up of all the national border guards, but then by reinforcing the actual component that is the agency with this standing core, you provide the ability also to provide m meaningful uh, solidarity and support also in, 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 in external border and also in terms of return uh, uh, operations. Then, of course, I mentioned already Turkey and the external dimension. So we've, we've also, um, I think we can say that was a, a success. Um, in many respects, um, but we've also given a lot of uh, financial support to refugees in Turkey, not forgetting, of course, that there are large numbers, I mean, upwards over three million, four, up towards four million uh, displaced people in, <coughs> largely from Syria, in, in Turkey, and we've given a lot of uh, support under this uh, facility for refugees in Turkey. Um, we've also obviously uh, had to um, pay attention to the situation in Libya, uh, which is very, very difficult. Um, uh, and we work very closely with Italy, I think, uh, in that respect. And of course, we've also ha set up more generally, more widely, uh, EU Trust Fund for Africa, which is supporting 210 projects in, in 26 countries. So this is just to give you a taste of, of, of the various uh, aspects. There are many, many more. Now, coming to the lessons learned from this, well, we've got to be prepared for events. Um, Andrea, I, I totally agree with you. You used the word trust many times, and I fundamentally think that uh, one of the things we have to work towards is to, to regain that trust, um, because we saw a breakdown of that trust very visibly in the course of the, uh, of the last years, and, and we've got to claw that back. I think we've made a good start, but uh, we need to consolidate that. Um, we need to know also what's going on. We've made strides in improving our monitoring in terms of data analysis, but we can do more. We need to do more uh, because otherwise you're a bit blind in terms of what's going on. So we, we, this is one of the lessons I think we've learned. We've learned that um, the existing legislative uh, framework which makes up the common European asylum system has been stretched to its limits, I would say, and um, we need to learn the lessons uh, from the last years in terms of putting in place a more stable set of arrangements. But it's going to be difficult, and we've seen that. It's unfinished business. Um, we also, um, maybe this is the easiest take or takeaway of the, of the last few years, the need for a comprehensive answer. Um, Andrea mentioned that. We fully agree. You're not going to, there's no single magic silver bullet that will, will provide the answer. Uh, it's a combination of, of many things interacting together. I mentioned the borders, the external borders. You can't just deal with it that way, but that's an important element. Working with partner countries is an essential element, but it's something that takes time as well. It's an investment and it takes time and it needs continuous investment. So this is another element. Uh, we also need the internal dimension, as I said, a stable system. So that's another takeaway. Um, and of course, we also saw just how important it is politically um, in our domestic uh, politics. Uh, so we, it's not a surprise that it was a priority in the last commission, and I think it will very much remain a priority in the, in the coming commission. So I mentioned already, for looking out of the way ahead, um, the political guidelines of the president-elect, which I think set out very well all these challenges and, and the interlinked uh, necessity of dealing with them all. One of them also is, that was mentioned by the president-elect, which I haven't mentioned up until now, is the need for having legal pathways, uh, humanitarian corridors. This is a very important um, also dimension of, of this. I mean, resettlement is, is, is a success story also that we shouldn't forget from, from the past years. Uh, just as other countries have been stepping back from this, the European Union has been stepping forward. It is something that we have to do in terms of demonstrating that we're 
you know, we're not closed to those in need, we are open to those in need, so it's, that's a very important element. Among others, and there's also the question of legal migration. Uh, so legal, mi legal pathways is an important element looking ahead as well. We mustn't forget it. Um, so we, we need to also manage the immediate challenges. That's always been a takeaway. For, so now <laughs> we look at the situation in Turkey, Syria. It's certainly very, very um, volatile and uh, we need to be prepared for that. So um, we've shown that we have been capable of responding, but we, this is a continuous challenge. We also saw over the summer the need for our solidarity um, and the Commission was there over the summer. It was a difficult summer in terms of crossings in the central Mediterranean. Andrea also mentioned this um, initiative in terms of the Valletta Declaration, which is something that the Commission uh, supports. Um, it was an initiative of these, of these member states. Now there's an attempt, I think, to, to bring it into a wider uh, setting. We support that as well. Um, the Commission is always there to help with coordination. Um, and that was something highlighted in the summer where, quite frankly, the Commission acted as the sort of facilitator in terms of bringing member states together to find um, uh, willing uh, participants in, in, in uh, helping both Italy and Malta uh, in terms of those rescued at sea. Um, and this is an essential role which, which the Commission has, has taken on. Um, and of course, looking forward in terms of the new pact, uh, I think you know this positive example needs to be to be sort of factored into our future thinking. So I, I just give you that as a flavour. I'm sure we'll have an opportunity uh, to exchange some further thoughts. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, insight. Uh, just a quick follow-up question. Uh, you spoke about unfinished uh, jobs, mm -hmm. and I was thinking, of course, about the Dublin reform. Mm -hmm. uh, so where are we now? Do you think that would be, be possible to reach an agreement on this, and how? Because I think that this is the most uh, controversial issue at the moment between the member states. Well, I mean, on, on this, we we have to find a way forward. We'll have to find a way forward, I think, on the basis of a new start, um, a fresh start. This is something that's, that's clear. So um, I think that uh, this is something we also heard from the, from the hearings in the, in, the, in the parliament. We also saw it from the mission letters uh, given by the president-elect to the uh, commissioner-designate and the vice president. Uh, designate in this area. Um, yes, this is, this is unfinished business, which means that we need to find a way forward here. That way forward, I think, will, will, will require some fresh thinking about how to bring people together. Because, uh, as Andrea mentioned, um, people, member states have come at this maybe from some different angles. <clears throat> and I think our challenge, uh, and I think that's the advantage, having a fresh start, is to um, rethink as much as we can um, the essentials. There's a lot that kind of brings us together. We have to accentuate these elements, accentuate the, 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 the positives, because there are many positives out there. Um, and I think on this basis we can consolidate the trust that we've both been speaking about, and find a way, a way through. I mean, solidarity will need to be there, um, but we need to think about the kinds of solidarity that are meaningful and useful. Um, and on this basis, uh, bring the member states together, also acknowledging that we have to think about the most efficient way of doing this. We need to think about um, giving the protection to those that need protection, because that's what our, underlies our values as a European Union, and we shouldn't ever forget that. And on the other hand, we also need to um, be conscious of the fact that, uh, um, and this is where the legal pathways come in, that we should prioritize these legal pathways, and I'm talking also here on the economic side, um, and also deal with uh, effectively, mo more effectively than, than we have been, the um, returning those who, who don't uh, need the protection that uh, we should give. So that's very 
easy thing to say, but it's something that's very demanding for us, uh, uh, and we need to give a good attention to that. We have been. We've been entering into a number of uh, re readmission agreements uh, and arrangements with, with third countries, but this is a, a big investment also, as I mentioned before, in terms of getting the cooperation with third countries um, so that we have this understanding it, on all sides that there are legal pathways, but um, not an open d back door, if I can put it that way. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so you mentioned in your, uh, in your presentation a lot of elements, but uh, you briefly mentioned also the legal migration, uh, which is um, often neglected a little bit, uh, but indeed is a, is, a, is a part, is an essential part of a longer and comprehensive str strategy if we think about uh, the migration policy. Uh, and this is why I would like to ask Gertrui maybe to focus a little bit more on this. Uh, Gertrui, you are working for the IOM, which, is, uh, uh, which has a leading role in addressing uh, the migration challenge nowadays. He's working closely with the European Union, with the member states, and you specifically are working on legal migration and um, and integration of migrants. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would like you to focus a little bit on this and uh, uh, tell us what IOM is doing on this and what's your take on, uh, mm -hmm. on uh, legal migration and integration. What should we do uh, more on, uh, on this side? Thank you. Good, thank you very much. It's not an easy question, <laughs> but uh, we will try to answer. Um, I think what came up in the previous um, discussions was definitely that, you know, with increased arrivals up to two million people in two years, there was a lot of focus on responding to these immediate challenges, and somehow the bigger picture got a bit lost. Um, so if you ask if there's need for this new policy, I would say yes, but there's definitely need for, let's say, a more comprehensive and forward-looking policy that goes perhaps beyond you know, responding to the immediate challenges, but also looking more holistically, how can we manage migration in the best possible way, not only now, but also in the future, and what is it that we can expect, not only tomorrow, but one year, two years, ten years from now, and how are we going to respond? Now, of course, I mean, things are not always easy to predict. Um, I agree with that. Um, but there are certain things that I think we can't ignore. Uh, you mentioned demography at the start. Uh, for sure, in Europe, we are confronted with aging populations, uh, more and more shortages also on our labor markets, while in Africa we see you know, a very growing population of young people who can impossibly you know, all be absorbed in their local labor market. So we can only expect that migratory flows, for example, from Africa to Europe are going to continue and even increase in the future. So the key question for us is really, how do we want to manage this um, in the best possible way? And indeed, you know, legal pathways are uh, part of that. Um, now, it's true that this has been perhaps a bit um, neglected. It's a key pillar of the European agenda on migration, legal migration, but in the recent years, we've seen that most focus has been perhaps on legal pathways for people in need of resettlement, um, in need of protection, such as resettlement and other complementary pathways, rather than looking at the economic uh, labor migration pathway. So, we think that here there's uh, a need to do more um, because employers are really demanding this from us. Uh, they may be not present in this room, I don't know, uh, but they have very high stakes in this and I think it's time to find a solution. Um, we have to all admit that there is need for well-managed uh, migration to support the economic growth and to fill the shortages that we might have in our labour markets. Now, the European Commission recently conducted a very interesting evaluation of the existing, let's say, legal and policy framework on legal migration, the so-called fitness check, which basically had as objective to evaluate what's what we have already in terms of instruments. Does this function well? Is this sufficient? What are the gaps and what could we possibly do? I think these kind of exercises are very important to also inform a possible future policy, because there were interesting recommendations made there. Um, it's true that there are a number of instruments, there are different directives from the blue card for the highly skilled to the seasonal workers, the intercorporate transferees, the students and researchers, but it remains very much a patchwork. Um, so one of the main findings was that, you know, we miss a bit this holistic 
policy. It's a bit of patchwork where we try to, you know, respond to gaps left and right without maybe a proper holistic framework, which also makes that we are perhaps as a destination in Europe less attractive than certain other destinations like, let's say, Canada. So what is it that we can do to become more attractive and to make sure we have the right policy framework in place? There are some gaps, but also what is there is not necessarily well implemented. There's a lot of, let's say, differences between the way different member states interpret some of these directives. Uh, there's a lot of burden sometimes also in terms of administrative procedures. So employers are really crying out to say, please, we need you know, easier processes to make sure we can attract the workers that we need. And again, these are not necessarily only the highly skilled. Um, there was a lot of attention to uh, the highly skilled with an attempt also to revise uh, the blue card with some very good you know, ideas there. But that as such you know, will not be sufficient in our view. Um, if you look at top bottleneck vacancies uh, in Europe that are hard to fill, more than half of those are medium to low skilled, uh, not only highly skilled. And it's precisely there that in many member states we are missing actually channels that allow for legal migration of medium to lower skilled. So as a consequence, what often happens is that these uh, needs are met by uh, well, irregular workers uh, in the informal sector. And I don't think this is you know, the right uh, response. So, uh, in short, definitely need to do more on that, recognizing that the Commission has done a significant effort with a fitness check, with the attempt to revise the blue card, but also with a recent initiative on legal migration pilot projects, basically to work with the member states that are willing to do something, um, that are really seeing this need, and to try out some models with different countries, uh, for example, in North Africa, to test how can this work and hopefully also be then um, expanded in the future. Okay, thank you very much. So it's really like uh, a broader picture now. Uh, do you have some specific recommendation addressing uh, uh, legal migration? So what should we really focus on in the next uh, years? more pilot projects or assessing more what the member states are doing and try to learn some best practices or what should mm -hmm. we do? Yeah. Um, well, um, if you ask me, <laughs> I think the first point is that we should look at what is it that we need and what are our labour market needs. Um, Unfortunately, sometimes illegal migration is still too much framed in a discussion where, okay, member states that cooperate on readmission will give them something in return, but is it there that we can find a solution to what we need? So it's a question of also looking what will work for us, where can we find uh, these solutions? Um, and I think looking at already existing flows, for example, in Eastern Europe, Poland is one of the countries, you know, that issues the highest number of work permits for third country nationals. There is a high inflow of workers from the Eastern neighborhood. I think there a lot can be done to manage these flows actually better. So I would uh, really um, not just focus on perhaps Africa, which seems now the obvious, but realize that a lot of migrant workers also come from the East, and how can we actually work on that and make sure these flows are well managed? And I'm here thinking of questions, for example, related to also ethical recruitment, protection of migrant workers, and so on. Um, then a second recommendation I would make goes more in the direction also of integration because one point is you know bringing the people bringing the workers um, another point is how can we actually make sure that these are also well integrated and i think again when the attention was more on the first response to the immediate arrivals the whole integration part moved a bit more to the background but now as the numbers go down we still need to invest in integration probably for the next decade and more um, and here uh, we see also that, let's say, potential of migrants and refugees that are already here is often underused because uh, often they're not employed. If they're employed, it's often below their level of their skills and qualifications. So what can we do to make sure, you know, migrants that are here, refugees that are here, can be employed up to the full level of their potential? But this will need more work in terms of, you know, sorting out questions related to recognition of skills and qualifications. Um, the other issue is, of course, that the economies in different member states are very different. And here, there was also this question related to secondary movements that comes up very often, but it's very hard to prevent secondary movements if migrants and refugees know that in another country I might have better integration support, I might have more economic opportunities. So we have to also think around that and 
As a concrete example, let's see Greece, where so many refugees arrived. Um, we are still now very much challenged on the integration because we're talking also of countries that really don't have those systems in place, that are not necessarily countries that have traditionally received many migrants. If I compare Greece with Germany, I think it's obvious that, you know, for refugees in Greece, it will be much harder, for example, uh, to integrate or to find a job because these structures are simply not in place. And a lot of money has been pumped into, let's say, this first reception capacity. But we're now in a situation where refugees who arrived two or three years ago are still in these first reception facilities and clearly you know, the new arrivals then, you know, don't have reception and so forth. So there is a need to move beyond this reception to really think of integration, even in a context like Greece, where that's very difficult. And what can we do um, to support member states like Greece? Because I think it would be very unfair to say, well, this is now their burden. And maybe coming back then to the question of the legal migration and the skills, what can we do to promote also more intra-EU mobility of people who are already present? Let's say you're a refugee, you've been recognized, you've got your status in Greece. You have certain skills and qualifications that could be interested for other member states, but basically the Greek labor market, you know, does not have opportunities for you. Can we enhance, you know, intra-EU mobility for such people to make sure, you know, we give people the best opportunities. I think it's something that was also explored uh, with the revision of the blue card, so maybe this is something to look in further. Okay, lots of recommendations. Thanks, so. yes. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and now, before uh, starting the question and answer uh, sessions, I would like to come back to Andrea. Uh, maybe, I don't know if you want to add something on uh, Italy. So, for instance, we mentioned and we talked a lot about legal migration integration. So, are we talking uh, enough about this also in Italy? Uh, and then second question is more about what uh, uh, Michal was telling us, unfinished jobs like uh, the Dublin reform. So what's the position of Italy uh, on, on this? No, thanks. Uh, definitely picking up where, where Michael uh, left off, uh, uh, definitely an unfinished uh, business from the previous uh, uh, legislative uh, uh, cycle. Um, and something that the new commission uh, and member states uh, will have to pick up uh, as the, uh, inst the new institutional cycle uh, uh, commences. Uh, um, where do we stand on this uh, is pretty clear. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, as I was saying at the beginning, uh, it, it's important to place it in a broader context of a multi-level uh, approach. Same applies for the Lavaletta Declaration, same applies for, uh, uh, for Dublin. Uh, secondly, it is important to restart it uh, with uh, trust among the parties, uh, which is not uh, a uh, catchphrase, but is a way to say that it is important that the um, proposals or the communication which will be presented by the commissions uh, be be and be perceived uh, as uh, uh, as balanced. Uh, and thirdly, uh, work on uh, Dublin uh, um, in a way to uh, achieve uh, a proper balance between uh, responsibility and uh, solidarity, meaning that the uh, responsibility uh, side of the argument uh, towards frontline member states uh, be not be uh, be not. Uh, unbalanced vis-a-vis uh, -vis the solidarity uh, aspects uh, in concrete terms, uh, in terms of uh, procedures that uh, uh, have to be uh, implemented upon disembarkation, in terms of length of the um, responsibility period uh, uh, that uh, frontline member states have to uh, take, uh, take care of. Uh, there is lots of technical work which, uh, uh, in our view, uh, can be done, for instance, on the criteria of Dublin, the so-called Dublin criteria. How do you determine the responsibility for frontline member states? There's a whole set of criteria establishing uh, the responsibility, the length. And if you work on those criteria, you can actually even uh, prevent uh, onward movements, secondary uh, movements. Um, 
so yes, it's a work that needs to be finished, started and uh, uh, finished um, in a holistic and multi-level approach and by addressing it uh, from the start in a, in a balanced way. And in this, uh, um, I mean, we, um, we've heard uh, uh, the Commissioner-designate uh, uh, Johansson at the public hearing, so public information that uh, um, as soon as she start, uh, she takes office, uh, she intends to listen to member states, to all member states, and uh, we think that is a very uh, good start. Instead of starting on day one by presenting something, you start on day one by listening because by listening you promote uh, also trust among all the parties, uh, uh, like also these uh, uh, informal gatherings, uh, like uh, like today. The, I mean, the, the final goal and the importance of these gatherings is to, in a more informal setting, promote communication and understanding and mutual trust among member states and their respective positions. Okay, thank you very much. Do you want to add something? No, it's fine. Uh, so I'm sure there are... Yes? yes. Um, but this listening also has to be in the direction of the European Parliament. I'd like to underline that. So we in the Commission, we are very conscious of the, <coughs> of the fact that the European Parliament did a lot of work on the proposals that were put on the table. Um, and that is very useful uh, in, in the Commission's reflections and, and it's also something that uh, we should bear in mind. Um, also, this work, this investment in the, in the proposals is something um, in examining the, the fresh start, um, which we need, I think, to, 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 to reboot the discussion. It doesn't mean um, discarding all that has been achieved. I think we have to go through carefully and look uh, at what has been extensively discussed over these last years and where we see that there's a solid level of progress and a really solid basis for agreement between both, well, all sides, um, you know, it would be obviously a bit daft to um, start all over again. On the other hand, there are those proposals which we know are the trickiest and I think it's there that we need to, to, to focus on our, our reconsideration. Okay, so to start again. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. So now it's time for, uh, for your questions. Uh, I'm sure that there are many questions from the audience, so um, I'm, um, I'm opening now uh, the floor to you. Uh, I will collect uh, first a few questions. Uh, please uh, uh, say your name and organization uh, when asking a question, and if you are addressing a specific uh, speaker, just uh, say it at the beginning of your question. And of course, also comments are uh, allowed and welcomed, uh, as long as they are short, and to the point. Uh, so please, I have Vit here, and then maybe Michel and in the back as well. <coughs> okay, Vit Novotny is the senior research officer at the Martin Center in charge of migration. Vit. Thank you. Thank you for uh, doing the introduction for me. I have two questions for the panel. Um, one is um, a long term, one is a short term. Um, the long term one concerns the use of uh, EU development aid and the new direction set by the Commission in terms of setting conditionality on, this, uh, on the spending of the development aid. Uh, so my question is, does this work? Uh, are the recipient countries responding to those conditions attached to the development aid, such as better guarding of, the, of, the, of their borders, um, better systems, better databases, better migration management? and also addressing the root causes. So is it working or is it too early to say? And the first, um, the other question is more short term. Um, a lot of un, um, unsettling things are happening uh, between Turkey and Syria right now. Um, are e the EU's uh, crisis managers um, planning for a possible return of 2015 and 16 crisis? <laughs> You want to do several questions? Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. My name is okay. Michael Benamou from the consultancy Aaron Praxis. My question will prolong Witt's uh, query. Um, uh, what do you think about CSDP operations right now? EU CSDP operations, security missions. Um, 
uh, do they uh, or do they think do you think they're fully integrated within uh, this development and aid programs that the EU is also delivering on the ground? And specifically, what do you think about Operation Sofia uh, at the moment, uh, which is operating close to Libya? There's still no agreement on um, you know, putting back a maritime component to this mission, which makes it quite um, you know, uh, not productive, I might say. So what do you think about the future of this operation and the future of other uh, UCSDP operations? Thanks a lot. Okay, maybe a last one in the back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mohammed Rajai Barakat. Uh, I work now as uh, European Affairs Expert for BBC Arabic, France 24 Arabic, Radio Monte Carlo and others. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, are you going to consider uh, refugees, Syrian refugees now, as migrants or you have some plans, you have a strategy at the European Commission so as to let them turn back when war in Syria uh, is going to finish and I think it's the end now. Uh, you spoke about uh, uh, migrants who are uh, high level skilled, who have uh, uh, diplomas and uh, we need them in Europe. I remember five years ago when Mrs. Uh, Cecilia Malmström was a commissioner for justice. She said in SEPS that Europe, if we want to keep the same level of development, we need 20 million migrants during the next 20 years. And Mrs. Merkel, when she received the more than 1 million refugees, Syrian refugees and others, she said that Germany needs more than six or seven million new arrivals. And the practices of uh, many countries now, you are taking the good elements from third world countries and you bring them here to Europe. And it's very bad to our countries in the Middle East and Arab countries. I give you the example in Jordan, you have the German University. They send uh, the students study in Jordan for four or five years and they send them for uh, training in Germany. And many of them, maybe most of them, uh, they suggest work for them in Germany. And it's a loss for our countries. You spoke about uh, Turkey. Uh, President Erdogan said uh, yesterday or before yesterday that Turkey spent more than 50 billion euros. And now you are speaking that you said that uh, European Commission or European Union paid more than 10, million, uh, 10 billions, I think. Uh, mm. What we heard is that the uh, agreement with Turkey, it was for six billions, and uh, a Turkish uh, president said that it was not paid fully. And if, when EU pay for refugees in uh, Turkey, they pay for NGOs, European NGOs. What do you think about that? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So we have... Uh a lot of questions already. Uh, development aid and root, uh, addressing root causes. Uh, is this working? Situation in Turkey and Syria. CSDP operations like uh, also uh, Sofia. Uh, Syrian refugees and high level skilled migrants. Uh, so who wants to start? Do you want? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I like to, um, yeah, there's a lot in, uh, in, in these, uh, these questions, really a lot. But um, I would like to pick up um, on uh, the middle question of the last uh, uh, gentleman uh, representing BBC, I think, uh, Arab BBC, because it introduces uh, a point of view which we have uh, neglected, probably guilty, <laughs> which is the point of view of the third countries. I mean, uh, Michael rightly mentioned the, the, the European... Uh, uh, the European Parliament, uh, uh, but in our introduction, in our speeches, uh, we probably neglected the point of view of the third country. So thank you for for raising uh, uh, for raising this, because uh, as the topic is uh, debated uh, uh, in our own country, so it is in uh, in third countries. Uh, uh, there are there are electoral cyc cycles, uh, public opinion. So thanks for bringing to the table this, uh, this this point of view, which is extremely relevant, and it's relevant uh, because uh, as we promote a multi-level approach 
Some things can be done at a national level. Other things can be done at a level of the European Union. Other things which are extremely important uh, uh, need the cooperation by uh, third, uh, uh, third countries. Uh, um, whether we're talking about addressing the root causes, uh, um, improving economic conditions, uh, socioeconomic conditions, uh, capacity building, it all requires and involves a, uh, a structured and positive dialogue with, uh, with third, uh, third countries. Um, this uh, relates a, a little bit also to the to the question raised by uh, by by Vit on the use of uh, development uh, uh, aid. I don't know if Michael wants to elaborate on that, but uh, in our, from our perspective, I think you're referring to ongoing uh, uh, discussion. So maybe it is too early to to see, but uh, uh, I think that the European Union collectively uh, has tools at its disposal uh, for this dialogue with uh, third countries. Uh, you can call it leverage, you can call it uh, uh, incentives. Uh, we prefer yeah, more positive uh, uh, wording or uh, labeling. Um, so yes, uh, the um, uh, development aid uh, should be brought into uh, the picture. And what we're looking for from the next uh, commission, and I know it's very hard because it's hard internally on a mission, I can understand the commission, is a bit to break the cycle, the, the silos, break the silos between the policy components, between the tools at disposal, in order that the European Union can maximize its dialogue with, Europe, with uh, third countries uh, by leveraging also on, uh, on, um, on development uh, uh, aid and, all, and on all the tools. Uh, among these tools, CSPD um, missions, uh, of course, there is a tendency to uh, involve uh, better the JHA, uh, the Justice and Home Affairs section in this uh, common security uh, operation. It's, it's, um, it's the right way to, to proceed from our point of view because the, the problems on the ground are uh, extremely uh, complex that you need uh, um, a wide array of, uh, of skills and the civilian military uh, cooperation. Um, on the specific question of oh, Sofia, anyway, you would come back to it. Uh, the, uh, the, the, I think that the discussion is, is, is there. It's uh, on the renewal of, uh, of the mandate, which was lastly renewed without the military uh, component. It links to the very sensitive issues of uh, um, of disembarkation. So as we progress uh, uh, in finding a common uh, um, uh, agreement on how to handle disembarkation following SAR operation, maybe this can have uh, uh, some influence and impact on the period of discussions uh, regarding Operation Sophia, which are dealt by a different uh, silos, I would say. So that's why it's important sometimes to look uh, horizontally. Okay, thank you very much. Michael? Well, I think Andreas answered the questions, so that's not so much for me to say, but I, I, I can try and elaborate a little bit. I mean, the Commission, looking ahead, I think, uh, these mission letters that I, re I referred to, uh, they set out also the, the objective that the Commission will have to be a, a sort of geopolitical commission. And I think that could translate in this, in this area as as Andrea said, breaking down silos, being joined up. Um, and I think if we look at it in those terms, I also prefer, prefer the positive uh, language because we have to understand that this is, you know, people understand uh, when you have partnerships, people, that's a nice positive word in terms of uh, building these relations. And, uh, but we also should be, uh, savvy in terms of joining up our, our policy tools and and I think this in a, in a sort of more for more context is is something that uh, is, is, is perfectly reasonable in terms of you know obviously we come with our objectives and our objectives also uh, involve cooperation on for example subjects like readmission um, and that's something where we obviously would like to see good cooperation and in that in that context, as something this is 
picked up by the European Council on previous occasions. This involves linking different policy tools that we have at our disposal and I think the examination of whether we do that adequately at the present and I think looking forward there's an aspiration to, to exploit and explore these possibilities better in the, in the future. When it comes to the situation uh, Turkey, Syria, obviously this is one example of events. There will always be events. I mean, I wish that uh, we lived in perfect stability, but uh, uh, looking ahead with uh, climate change, um, demographics, obviously we're, we're not going to live in, in, in this world. There will always be events and we have to be as well prepared as, as we can be. And that's why the EU has equipped itself with um, tools over the last years growing out of the experience we had from 2015. These tools are in place in terms of sharing information, analyzing risks. There are still those tools in place and, and, I, and I think that they're useful. That experience is something that does enable us to be better prepared. It's not a question of um, you know, raising fears. It's just a question of being prepared. And I, and I think that's something that one has to always uh, maximize. Um, in terms of uh, CSTP operations, uh, I think Andrea put it very well. Uh, the CSTP is a more member state driven uh, area. I, it, these operations are triggered by, by uh, obviously, and, and require active uh, engagement by especially the member states that are, you know, uh, in this case, uh, what was essential for the naval operation is the place of disembarkation. We saw a snapshot earlier, and I'd like to think as we move forward, um, we, you know, it's not a static situation. Uh, we have seen the situation evolving in one way, and it could obviously, uh, depending on, on developments, continue to evolve. Um, obviously, Operation Sophia is still in place without the naval uh, component on the ground or on the sea, um, but in the air it, it, it is still operational and 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 playing a a role, a, a, a useful role um, in terms of um, I would say not only uh, the smuggling anti-smuggling component, but also helping uh, in, in saving uh, lives as well. Um, when it came to uh, the question about, uh, if I can characterize it as, as brain drain, uh, yes, this is something that uh, uh, we have to be uh, conscious about. It in, uh, and, and I think that um, we heard the mention of these pilot projects. Um, but I think these pilot projects are a nice example of how you can develop um, uh, legal migration pathways, um, which, I mean, we have a number of these tailor-made examples, but they do involve um, a sort of circular movement. And the experience gained, I think, then is intended to be taken back to the, the countries of origin. Of course, these models are, are as I say, tailor-made, and they have different uh, complex, uh, complexions depending on, on the particular pilot project. but. They, ha they do involve this returning with the experience, so it can be seen as a win-win situation. Um, I think also we have to take into account um, the importance of uh, remittances, which is a very, uh, also an important uh, element. Maybe you have something more to say on, on, on that. So, um, and then finally, you, 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 you mentioned the 10 billion and the six. For, for the facility for refugees in Turkey, we're talking there about uh, six billion. The money is, I mean, we have to look at the way the money works in our budgetary cycle, but it's all fully committed, and yet the the, the spending under under it was always foreseen to sort of carry on. So the, in our budgetary rules, we, we have the commitments, and then the actual spending takes place. Everything is, I would say, fully on, on schedule. So we have delivered on that. Uh, we have delivered on, on from our side on many aspects of, of the EU-Turkey EU statement. And as the name says, facility for refugees in Turkey, it was always intended to help the refugees in Turkey. Um, and, so, and, that's what, and that's what it has done, uh, very much so.
Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if Gertrude, <coughs> do you want to add something on brain drain? On <coughs> Maybe on that and on the question of the aid conditionality, aid, exactly. the use of development aid and conditionality. Um, I would say there is no proof as such that this conditionality works, and I think uh, there's really a need to bring in other tools and instruments when we talk about enhancing you know, cooperation with third countries. Um, for example, thinking of uh, visa policies, trade, and so on. And probably when we want to look at cooperation with third countries, we have to broaden this and look at all these different instruments and areas and not just focusing on migration alone or development cooperation alone. Again, with the idea, where are their interests? Where are their interests? How can we find somehow a win-win in a genuine partnership? But I think this really requires to involve many different tools and instruments uh, from trade to visas and not just, you know, focusing on, uh, for example, uh, development cooperation. I personally, you know, am not convinced that a country that, for example, refuses to cooperate on return and readmission with a simple development project would suddenly, you know, change uh, their mind on that. I think, you know, if we want a genuine partnership, we have to look at much more um, than just that. Then the question of the brain drain, very important indeed, and thanks for bringing in this perspective. And again, looking at a genuine partnership with the third countries, where is it that we find the win-win? And indeed, the pilot project had this aspect of facilitating Alta, I would say, a form of skills mobility. This is also where the concept of these global skills partnerships comes from, that we invest in skills, not necessarily skills for countries of destination, but also skills for countries of origin. Um, and maybe a last point. Um, again, I don't think we just need highly skilled in Europe, and there are many cases where you have medium or lower skilled people that cannot find jobs in their countries that could actually find jobs here. So how can we facilitate that matching on a more global scale between the demand and the supply? Uh, plus, how can we facilitate you know, a greater mobility. I think many um, migrants are ready to return, not necessarily permanent, perhaps uh, temporary to their countries. Um, but if you have very strict policies that don't really allow people, you know, to be mobile, um, that restricts, you know, these opportunities that actually migration could have to also, you know, turn this uh, brain drain in a brain gain. Let's put it like that. Okay, thank you very much. So I think that we still have time for a couple of questions. Yes, in the back. Maurizio Geri from NATO HQ. My question is regarding the current situation with Turkish-Syrian crisis, if uh, EU has a contingency plan to prevent the risk of uh, terrorist or radicalized people coming. Uh, someone spoke about Operation Sofia. There is Operation Sea Guardian from NATO that collaborated with Sofia also. And uh, Sofia has no ships, Sea Guardian has ships. So what about uh, possible uh, cooperations between EU and NATO and even non-state actors like IOM or ICRC on the risks coming from the Eastern Mediterranean? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will come back to you and then we will see if we still have time. Uh, so again, Turkey, Syria. Well, I mean, uh, as I answered already, uh, we have, and because there was a, the question, I think, from this side, yes, we, we always try and keep uh, abreast of, of, of developments, and we uh, plan and, uh, uh, and uh, anticipate uh, how those are, that there are mechanisms in place uh, for keeping the situation on all the routes in place, and obviously we're monitoring very carefully um, what's happening at the moment uh, along the Turkish-Syrian uh, border. In terms of cooperation with NATO, I mean, this is something that has been uh, something I have observed over the last, uh, last years. And at, at the time of the height of the crisis, I think there were <laughs> NATO uh, vessels also uh, on deployment uh, in the Aegean. Um, and of course, it's, it's something uh, um, very, very relevant, as it is with uh, the ongoing partnerships we have with the, with the IOM. I mean, we mentioned earlier um, uh, Libya um, and 
various uh, places w in terms of our work on, on returns, on assisted voluntary returns. Uh, we work with the UNHCR also in these third countries. All these relationships are essential for us uh, and, and built into to, to our work. We also have uh, partnerships with uh, UNHCR and IOM actually in, also in Greece, which have been, uh, which are ongoing and which have been, with, been necessary. So you're absolutely right to flag, you know, this is not something that uh, one is, se is selfish about in terms of what one should involve everyone uh, within the, in their sort of scope of activities uh, because, uh, you know, it, it's all very important. Uh, and for example, I take the situation of, of something very, uh, I think useful in the, in the Libyan context. We know how difficult it is in Libya. Um, and the work on the ground of UNHCR or IOM in establishing these humanitarian corridors. We have one uh, for Niger and recently, more recently, one uh, in Rwanda. And of course, this is a way of relieving the, the pressure the, uh, of the, in, the, in the humanitarian terms, the very difficult humanitarian situation in Libya, getting people out of camps there, putting them in a safer place where then we can talk about these legal pathways in terms of having carried out the assessments for, for resettlement. This is, a, I think, a, a promising way of, of developing a model for the future rather than having uh, desperate people looking to smugglers for, for, for a way forward, which is not at all what we should be uh, encouraging. Uh, this, this model is something we have to break uh, and with partners like IOM and UNHCR, that's indeed what we're working towards. Okay, thank you very much. Andrea? No, perhaps just to reinforce the point Michael just made uh, now on the humanitarian uh, corridors because there are lessons learned uh, from uh, current situations or, or from the immediate uh, past and uh, uh, this one of the humanitarian corridor is something that uh, we stress uh, very much because it provides uh, uh, safe access to Europe or Italy for those who are truly in need of international protection and fleeing conflicts. It allows for international cooperation with uh, UNHCR and IOM. Italy, for instance, uh, cooperates with UNHCR when we do humanitarian corridors bilaterally, nearly 1,000 people this year reached Italy through these uh, means with the involvement of the conference, the Episcopal Conference. And also we cooperate with IOM on the emergency transit mechanisms uh, in uh, uh, Niger and, um, and, uh, and Rwanda. And lastly, it uh, takes the grass off from the business model of the smugglers, which from our perspective is always very important. So uh, it is a, a, an interesting and a positive uh, uh, experience uh, um, uh, which we look at very favorably and would like to see it even uh, reinforced. Okay, just the last question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much again. Huh? Uh, I have two points. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, when you speak about Libya, uh, the European Council, the ministers of foreign affairs, uh, several times they promised Libya to f create funds so as to develop countries, African countries around Libya, and they promised to change their uh, cooperation policy with Africa so as to develop these countries, and like this, people are not going to come to Europe through Libya. But I noticed that and as uh, Libyan uh, uh, high level uh, responsibles uh, said that uh, nothing has been done from the side of European Commission. Uh, what do you think about that? And uh, when you speak about migration, uh, we speak about uh, public opinion, uh, people are afraid from migrants. Uh, we speak about populism, and uh, nobody is speaking about, we speak always about migration from the south to the north. And nobody is speaking about migration from the north to the south. Maybe if you speak a lot about that, people are going to change their opinions. 
They are not migrants, Europeans who go to Gulf countries, to Arab countries, to Africa. They are not migrants, they are expatriates, uh, which is uh, less uh, pejorative, okay. as we say in French. Huh? I okay. think it's important to speak about that. Uh, when you take a country like uh, Emirate Arab, uh, uh, they, they are 90% of habitants there, they are foreigners, and most of them are Europeans and Americans. If I, I have two nationalities, Belgian and Jordanian nationality, if I go there as a Jordanian, I am a doctor or engineer, I will, maybe they will pay me $2,000 a month. But if my name is Roberto or John, my salary is going to be 20,000 or 30,000 a month and they will give me apartment. And, and nobody in Europe is speaking about this discrimination. Okay. And we use in Qatar, for example, to criticize 2,000 workers died during the construction of uh, infrastructures uh, for the uh, football games next year. And nobody says that companies who are engaging them to work are Americans, Europeans, um, uh, basics, the Belgian company and others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So again, Libya, maybe Andrea, we can elaborate a little bit more because Libya is a strategic partner, yeah. first of all, for Italy and for all the migratory flows through the central Mediterranean route. And then I think the second question is more about a narrative. So how to change the narrative on migration? No, Libya, okay, Libya would require a, a seminar in, in, in itself to, to address the, the, the situation in uh, uh, in Libya, uh, the heart and uh, the core of it is the, the political uh, stabilization of, uh, of the country in which we are uh, highly committed and engaged uh, under the aegis of the United Nations because only through a sta fully stabilized Libya can we achieve the overall uh, uh, stabilization of the, uh, of the area. Um, I tend to disagree with the gentleman that nothing has been done and either in Libya nor in the neighboring countries because we are all very well aware that Libya is a transit country and uh, that you cannot address uh, uh, Libya without addressing the Sahel uh, where there is a lots and lots of activities conducted by the European Union by single member states. Uh, there is a European Union, uh, African Union uh, task force, maybe Michael will want to, to elaborate uh, um, on, uh, on that and it's a um, uh, it's, it's a case, a situation where the international community can work together and is working uh, uh, together towards the, 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 the common uh, goal. Of course, we have a particular interest uh, in that because it's uh, our, uh, our, our neighbor and that's the, the main uh, route in our cases is the central Mediterranean route. But we are aware that it is a transit country and that some of the problems need to be addressed also in the uh, in the neighboring Sahel region and the work of the African Union there is also very uh, relevant. Okay, I don't know if you want to add something on this? Very um, quickly. Very, very <laughs> quickly. I mean, it, I think uh, we have to tackle this as a, as a we have this phrase, the, the whole of route approach, and I think you have to look at it in those terms. You have to work in partnership with the, with the countries. I mean, when we're tackling the criminal networks uh, who are the smugglers of the sort of the people, and you're absolutely right when you mentioned, you know, every behind this is, is an individual, uh, a very desperate individual who's looking for a way through, who put themselves in the hands of, of criminal networks. These criminal networks often double up as criminal networks, not just for people, but also for drugs. So we can work in partnership with the, with the authorities along the route to, to sort of in a common cause of, of tackling these criminal networks, and that's what we do. And I mean, I have a figure here, it's not just lives that have been saved uh, in the Mediterranean, but our cooperation and partnership with, with, with countries in Africa has also led maybe into a lesser known uh, statistic, which is that um, there have been 23,000 uh, you know, individuals that were sort of rescued in the, in the, the Niger desert uh, since uh, 2015, because uh, in terms of this, of this cooperation. So that's also something to bear in mind. More generally, in terms of the, of the political discussion, uh, yes, we have to think of a way of getting uh, a, a, a new narrative that 
that restores the trust. I mean, the trust is not just necessary between member states, but I also think it's, it's trust also with the populations. The populations, um, you know, in the Eurobarometers that we, the, that we have, migration is top of, you know, right there at the top of the list of, people, of people's concerns. And I think we have to take that seriously. It doesn't mean that we have to um, respond with a populist na narrative. We shouldn't. Uh, we have to, but if we pretend that it's not a concern, we won't be able to, to change the narrative. So we, we have to, to face up to that, I think, um, because what's happened over these last years, the mass influx of two million people over two years, it's, it's not a small event, it's, it's, a, it's a major event, and it's something important that we give protection to those who need it. But I think we are closely uh, watched by, by European citizens to say, well, how are you going to deal with this? And, and it, we have to change that narrative to make sure that they see that we're dealing with this with a, a joined up policy approach. And I think that's what we need to, to look for, to, for the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that we had a great discussion, but we just started to rethink our uh, migration policy for the future. There's a lot still to say and to debate. Um, I want to thank again the speakers. Uh, we started with a question, uh, do we need a new pact uh, on, uh, on migration? And I think that we all agreed that yes, we definitely need a new fresh start on migration, but of course uh, without disregarding uh, what has been achieved and done uh, in the last years, which is uh, which is a lot. Um, we uh, all agree that it's not only about numbers, uh, so there are many challenges to cope also uh, to cope with also uh, in the future. Uh, we cannot have just a single magical solution, as we as we saw there are uh, many elements um, there. So we need definitely a more holistic approach, uh, a multi-level uh, a multi-level approach. And where should we start? Uh, we should start first of all from trust. So we need to regain, uh, reconsolidate the trust between member states, but also between the European Union and the citizens. Uh, and of course, we should not forget about uh, legal uh, channels and integration if we want to be serious about a longer uh, term strategy. So I think that this might be some takeaways from uh, today. Uh, but as I was saying, I think that uh, uh, this is a debate that we will be with us also uh, in the future. So thank you very much again for being here. And I want to thank again the Martin Center for, orga for organizing such an event with all the other foundations involved, which made this, this possible. Thank you very much and join us for lunch. <laughs>